Welcome to the third episode in a Legendarium series titled A History of Poland, The Deluge, Part 3. In the previous episode, we learned about how Tsar Alexei I of Russia abandoned his Cossack allies by making peace with Poland. Let's see what happens next. Determined not to make peace with his archenemy, the King of Poland, Bogdan Kimelnitsky, the leader of the Cossack rebels, allied with the Kingdom of Transylvania and the Crimean Khanate, and plowed through the Polish heartland. Everywhere Kimelnitsky's Cossacks marched, they set fire to buildings, chopped down grain, and stole livestock. Wherever they went, they left famine and ruins in their wake. While fortune favored Poland's enemies for now, King Jan II Casimir of Poland kept the war going by a simple and stubborn refusal to surrender. He allowed his kingdom to burn while he kept his army in their fortresses and kept them supplied by collecting donations from his own subjects at gunpoint. By now, the other nations of Europe grew to fear that Sweden might overrun Poland and then become a northern superpower. So Denmark, the Holy Roman Empire, the Kingdom of Brandenburg, and Poland formed an alliance against King Charles X of Sweden. Charles X chose the weakest power to overrun first. His Swedish army swept through Denmark, and with winter 1657 being shockingly cold, the Straits of Denmark froze solid. That ensured the Danish fleet would not be able to free their homeland from the Swedish army. Emboldened, the Swedes simply marched across the ice and besieged the Danish capital of Copenhagen. Suddenly, the King of Denmark wanted to talk peace and gave up most of his lands on the Swedish coast in exchange for an end to a war that went horribly wrong for him. With Denmark out of the war, Cossack leader Bogdan Kamelnitsky retreated south with his Transylvanian and Crimean allies. Jan II Casimir caught up with the Transylvanians, surrounded them, and allowed them to return home provided they swear never to return. However, the Crimean Tatars, hired by Poland at the time, signed no such terms, so they surrounded the beaten Transylvanians again and then sold thousands of them into the slave markets of Constantinople. To make peace with another enemy power, Brandenburg, Jan II Casimir of Poland made a fateful choice. Brandenburg always governed the state of Prussia, located within Poland, but only as a Polish vassal. Jan II offered Brandenburg the chance to govern Prussia without any Polish interference, an offer the House of Brandenburg accepted. In time, this new state, Brandenburg-Prussia, would have a profound impact upon the history of Europe. First, it would help to obliterate the Polish state a century after the deluge. Second, it would unite the many statelets of Germany into a powerful empire which would destroy the Russian Empire. Yet that is a story for another time. In the meantime, Charles X of Sweden died while making a final campaign to capture Copenhagen and wipe Denmark off the map. This proved devastating to his political and military career. It seemed that Jan II of Poland's strategy of simply trying to outlast his enemies worked, albeit at an appalling cost in Polish blood and tears. Yet soon it would be Russia's turn to worry. Despite some initial success, the Tsarist army soon bogged down around Swedish-held Riga. The Russian artillery bombarded the Swedish-held city day and night, until the population of Riga begged their governor-general to surrender. He refused, for he knew that the pieces on the Baltic chessboard quietly moved. First, the Swedish fleet arrived to blockade the Russians from the sea. Though Alexei I implored the Danes to send their fleet, it never arrived. Next, yet another member of the De La Garde family, this one named Magnus, began attacking Russian troops in their trenches, capturing 17 banners. It made no sense to continue the siege of Riga, so Alexei I of Russia ordered his armies back. 
gleeful Swedes took to joking that Alexei I banged his head against Riga. Indeed, Magnus de la Gardi grew confident enough in 1657 to invade Russia and besiege the border fort of Godov. There he faced the Russian boyar general Ivan Kovansky, known as Empty Talker among his comrades. Yet Kovansky showed himself more than empty talk when he battled de la Gardi on September 16, 1657, and drove him back home. However, the war with Sweden affected even the most remote regions of the Tsardom. Swedish fleets took to raiding Russian coastal towns and monasteries across the Baltic coast and the White Sea. During this round of fighting, Alexei I sent a message to Slovakia Monastery, on the coast opposite Finland, on the Arctic coast, where the monks stored gunpowder, lead, and cannons in their cellar. Upon receiving the Tsar's message, the monks built a two-story fortress and placed cannons in the parapets. A unit of Streltsy arrived from Archangel to reinforce the fortress, and together they drove off a Swedish fleet which sailed into the White Sea. With the war ground to a stalemate, Russia and Sweden signed a truce on August 23, 1658, at the town of Valisari. More than a year before the end of the Russian-Swedish War, Bogdan Kimelnitsky, the man who started the war in the first place by rebelling against the oppressive Poles, died of a stroke on July 27, 1657. His family laid him to rest in the Ilyinska church located in his beloved home village of Subatov, where the war started ten years ago. Yet how much time would pass before the war finally ended? We'll find out in the next episode. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.